Thank you again. What I'm going to do now... Oh, yeah, I'll do it. What I'm going to do now is to talk in the next uh, 55 or 60 minutes on the work that's going in my laboratory on the restriction modification systems in an organism which has come up into a major limelight in recent times, the Helicobacter pylori, a uh, harmless organism, 60, 50, 60% 60 of the world population have it, probably in India all of us have Helicobacter pylori, but very few can develop into uh, you know, strange things like gastritis, ulcers, and it's also a known type 1 carcinogen. In 1999, when the sequence was actually done, the genome sequence done for one of the strains, the 26695, and a year later on J99, it became very clear that Helicobacter pylori harbors a lot of uh, RM systems, or at least open reading frames that look like RM systems. This is the two types, I mean, this is uh, uh, sequences. And since then, a number of other uh, strains have been sequenced. And what became very clear from these sequencing studies of Helicobacter pylori genomes, that there are many genes which are strain-specific, which are present in a certain strain and not present in some other strains at all. And many of these strain-specific genes, as it's called, are, are the RM systems. RM enzymes, RM genes, so many of them are strain-specific. So now then it, it you know, comes down to this whole function of RM systems. Is it just defense? Is it just an immune system? Or does it have roles other than the, you know, attacking phages and things like that? And also at that time, you know, one wondered, you know, that, you know, at, in the, the, the Helicobacter pylori grows at a very acidic environment, in the acidic niche of the stomach, where the pH can be too, or, you know, very acidic. Where would you have phages coming in at that point? But there are phages, I believe, at least one or two phages which are known, which are known to attack Helicobacter pylori. But then the bigger question was, why so many RM systems? So from these genome sequences of these strains, it became very clear there are at least 40, 44, 45 open reading frames which correspond to the RM systems. And, you know, after some time, the study by NEB and the New England Biolabs clearly showed that many of these strains, at least 24, 25 of them, are active uh, enzymes. So we were interested because, you know, uh, NEB was interested in making enzymes and commercial uh, aspects of it. We were interested in the type 3 enzymes again. My interest in lab has been type 3 enzymes. But we also looked at other methods. We started off with methyl transferase. All our work has so far is only on methyl transferases. It's only now we have started working on the restriction enzymes of the Helicobacter pylori. Now, this is one of the first papers that you see, you know, somewhere in 2006 where it was published that in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, a chronic uh, uh, associated gastronoma of a cell line, or associated patient, many of these genes were actually monitored and studied. And one of them, which I've highlighted here among many, was this cytosine-specific DNA methyl transferase where the levels were, so the gene expression was uh, 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 high and it was also acid regulated at, uh, and these were actually found out. So this was the beginning of it that when a graduate student in my lab called Britesh, and I'll show you a picture of him because all this work is done by one graduate student in a record time of three, three years, three and a half years. In our institute, the PhD is usually five and a half years. But this guy did it very rapidly. And we looked at some of these uh, methyl transferases. And these are two methyl transferases. I've retained the old names, the HP0050 and 51. They have new nomenclature now, but I'll, I might use the new nomenclature. But these are two methyl transferases, which are solitary methyl transferases, just like the DAM and the DCM. These are orphan methyl transferases. They don't have a corresponding endonucleus at all. I'll come back to this point later on. And this is the, the chromosomal location is here, 50 and 51. And uh, NEP in its in the massive screening of all these restriction enzymes had shown that this methyl transferase uh, methylates uh, the cytosine on the top strand and adenine in the bottom strand. So one enzyme does job on the top strand, one does at the bottom strand. And one is a cytosine methyl and one is an adenine methyl transferase. And that's about the paper that was published in 2000 by Lynn and others. 
And that was the only evidence that available that these were metal transferases that were present. So Ritesh in my lab went on to do the experiments to do biochemistry because we wanted to crystallize some of these proteins and study structures because they were not so big as the type 3 enzymes, but they were small, smaller than is easier for crystallization and to study protein-DNA interactions. So I'll start off with the 5-1 enzyme, which is a cytosine metal transferase. And if you remember, the sequence is CCTC. So the first C is methylated, okay? And like all cytosine metal transferases, this has the PCQ motif, which is the uh, 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 site for a cytosine metal transferase. The FXGXG motif is here, and that is the SAM binding. The PCQ is for the C5 metal transferases. The adenine metal transferases have DPPY. You will remember the two motifs. So this is the sequence to show you that this is an enzyme which uh, Ritesh has been working on. So the first thing when you have a sequence, the easiest thing to do is to feed the sequence into a bioinformatics server in EMBN. So if you sit in the night in India and send it, by tomorrow morning you have a structure that comes out. Not a very nice way of doing it, but at least it gives you an idea what is the structure of this protein, a rough idea of the structure. And this is a model structure, and clearly like any other metal transferase, it has the SAM binding motif, the Rossmann fold, and it has a catalytic motif, and very clearly you can see this. So based on this, he did a lot of mutation analysis, and the first thing was to overexpress them. PCR amplified, overexpressed them, purified the protein to homogeneity, and he gets lots of protein. These are all done with tag, histidine tag at the end terminus. I, I specifically mentioned this because it's a very unusual thing that happened. So he gets lots of protein. He has a protein about 40 milligrams from one liter of culture. And you can, for the rest of your PhD, for five years, you can work on it. But what happened in the study was, that the first prep that he did, he got lots of amount. So I said, well, let's repeat some of the experiments, making a new prep. And so he made a new prep on that. So we studied some of these preps, and very clearly we determined all the physical properties, the gel filtration by a variety of methods, you know, by light scattering methods, by uh, gel filtration, by SDS page, and we showed that this is a monomeric enzyme. It always occurs as a monomer, it's 44 kilo Dalton protein. And uh, we studied the kinetics of this. And kinetics of methylation is very simple. Once you have a purified enzyme and you have radioactive SAM, you can change the enzyme concentration, you can change DNA, you can change SAM, and you can get all these parameters. Very easily you can get the kinetic constants, which is determined. And if you compare now these uh, values with the other known metal transfers, nothing unusual. It's like any other metal transferase. Except we get large quantities of metal transferase. Other people also get probably metal transferase, but we get large amount, which is very nice for us because we wanted to do crystal structure of this protein. One of the things that he found in his characterization was it had a metal binding site because when he added, the enzyme does not require metal, but if you add a metal, you can stimulate the activity. It's not necessary at all. And this is what it shows here, for example. Without the metal, you have activity, but when you add certain amounts of metal, like calcium and all, you get a slight increase in metal activity. So it's not like the P15 enzyme, which requires a metal for methylation. This just stimulates. <coughs> so this is what the first prep of enzyme, that 40 milligrams of protein he got, we did all the characterization. And then he was de uh, it was decided that you should do these experiments reproducibly. And that is where this whole story began for us. The second time when he made the prep, so you remember these are Helicobacter pylori genes expressed in E. coli. It's not in Helicobacter. It's that the genes of Helicobacter has been expressed in E. coli. We purified it, and then next time we took again the culture, the glycerol culture, plated it, picked single colonies, again made an enzyme. And every time we made an enzyme prep from one colony to the next generation, next generation, was seven times we did, each time we got a new enzyme. An enzyme with new properties. Where the metal affected or the metal didn't affect, the first cytosine was methylated or the second cytosine was methylated. And in some cases, which I've summarized here, 
There's one isoform. I don't know whether you call the term isoform. The third one, also methylates RNA. Not only DNA, but RNA. So we had, I have, I've listed here five of them here, but you have done seven times. And you see that kinetic properties are about the same. They're all in the 2020. There's nothing to be excited about this. But the specificity sometimes changed. The effect of the metal in some cases activated, in some cases inhibited, sometimes there's no effect at all. And this is worrisome because it is reproducibility. Can the student reproduce what he's doing? And that's always a doubt you have here. And true enough, he can reproduce it. Then there's a major problem because nothing is reproducible. Nobody else can repeat it. You know, that's a major problem we have. And we still have a major problem. We are fighting with journals for this, but you know, it's come up, it'll come up in a big way, I'm sure. So at the same time, he also looked at the phi zero, the adenine methyl transferase. And every time he made a prep, it was very consistent. There was nothing like the phi one. Phi one, every time you grew E. coli, you, you made evolution. <laughs> you made new enzyme. I mean, every time you grew, there was a new enzyme there. You don't have to do protein engineering. Nature was doing it for you. E. coli was doing it for us. So this worried us. So the biochemistry became now secondary. And we wanted to look into it. Why was this particular 5-1 overexpression in E. coli causing these mutations or causing these changes? And that's where we started analyzing that every time you grew the culture and made plasmid DNA and when we did sequencing, we found that every prep was heterogeneous. Not every prep was pure. In sequencing also you find, for example, these double peaks coming up and things like that here. So you had a mixture of things coming up there. At the DNA sequencing level we did that. We purified the proteins and did MALDI MS mass spectrometry. And again from MALDI MS spectrum analysis, both of trypsin and chymotrypsin digestion, we actually looked at each of these peaks. And again we found there could be heterogeneity, the small one amino acid changes. And these were occurring throughout the genome. This was when you were expressing the phi-1, the cytosine methyl transferase. If you express the phi-0, nothing happened. There are no mutations, nothing. Only when you express phi-1, you're getting this. So it became very important for us now to see whether an active methylase was important, or suppose we made a site-directed mutagenesis experiment, killed the methyl transferase, and then did it. So we made a cytosine, uh, you remember the cysteine, the PCQ, the C we mutated, and we made a catalytically inactive enzyme. And when we transformed this, there were no mutations at all. Only if it was catalytically active that these mutations were coming in. And any mutation that resulted in change of activity, we picked up. If there's any change that resulted in death or in inactive, we never picked it up. Only enzymes which were active, we focused. The other mutation, any other kind of mutation, we actually completely ignored. So we don't know what kind of mutations are happening in that. So this is a problem. So if you do this in E. coli, and every time you grow, then you're getting mutations. So we thought we'd analyze this whole process, I'll do it a bit more systematically. Sequencing both protein and DNA indicated that this was what was happening. So Ritesh in the lab then decided that enough is enough. So NEB have a, a in vitro transcription translation kit. So you isolate DNA and put it there, and then it makes a protein you can purify. So he did that and actually characterized some of this kinetic constant. They're all in the same ballpark of the other ones. But you know, this is a pure enzyme because it is only that template it is done. There's no mutations coming. It's an in vitro uh, transcription trans uh, translation kit that we have. But this was not enough for us. So we decided that we will now make a, we made a catalytically inactive mutant. We have a wild type mutant. We transformed this in E. coli and then did a microarray analysis. So of E. coli cells having the catalytic mutant expressed and the catalytically inactive mutant. Inactive and active mutant. We went through this procedure. We did RNA isolation, did microarray. We did protein purification to show that the specificity changes. And plasmid isolation to do MNL1 digestion. If you look at CCTC, you can use MNL1 digestion. If it's methylated or non-methylated, the digestion will not occur. But the other day, microarray analysis clearly told us that when you overexpress 5-1, the active 
but not the inactive Phi1, a number of mismatch repair genes are affected in E. coli. And the E. coli mismatch repair genes very well characterize the dimethylase, the mutage, the mutel, the mutes, the RegJ, the exo, and the SSP. Many of them. Not all of them are affected, but at least DAM and MUTEL, as you see here, are affected. I am no uh, you know, expert in microarray analysis. I don't believe this 2.56, uh, 5631526. I don't know, these numbers are very wild for me. So, but I think you know, 2.5 fold ratio is significant. So, we confirmed some of these results by doing RT PCR to show that this is actually genuine. And I said the mismatch repair genes are important for the mismatch repair. Any defect in mismatch we know in E. coli and many other organisms, you have mutation frequency. And, you know, it's a mutative phenotype, very well known in E. coli genetics and things like that. And therefore, we said that this was important. Now, if you look at the first one of the things that we studied here was the dam. Dam is an important component of mismatch repair. So the dam uh, promoter, if you look at, in E. coli, has a number of sites upstream, the CTCC, which actually is a target for this methylase. So one quick analysis was that when you overexpress this methylase, it was methylating these promoter sequences and damp levels were affected. Maybe similarly for mutel, of whichever genes were affected, there must have been this CTCC sites upstream where regulation was possible, gene regulation was affected. In DAM you have it, in MUTEL have it, but in MUTES, which is not so any effect, there are no CTCC sites at all. So very clear that this was happening. But the referees in the journals don't like this at all. They want more and more experiments. We thought this was good enough. It was a nice finding. And here is a, you know, a preliminary mechanism. But they want detailed mechanism. So then the next thing we did was to actually look at the DAM methylase activity uh, so the RT-PCR, we did that to confirm the microarray analysis and surely clearly showed that at 60 and 120 minutes, dam levels, mutel levels go down, the mutels doesn't go down. So overexpression of this, this cytosine methyl transferase, the helicobacter of cytosine methyl transferase in E. coli suppresses the expression of dam and therefore mutel and therefore of the mismatch repair and therefore you were getting mutations. So we actually now, we were asked to do the dam activity. So in crude uh, E. coli extracts, we did the dam methylase activity and clearly showed that when you have the mutant, the, C, the, the, the catalytically inactive mutant, the dam activity is not altered, but when you have the active methylase expressed over a period of time, the dam activity comes down. This is simply because the expression of dam is affected here. So we moved away completely from biochemistry because we're looking at this mechanism of what was happening here. Among many other genes, besides the mismatch repair, there are some of the other protein uh, genes like the, uh, the SSB, which is part of this. The UMUC, the, the, the SOS repair genes are also affected. There's not only the mismatch, but the error-prone uh, repair pathway uh, genes are also affected. We've confirmed one or two by RT-PCR. But what was important for us, because the referees again asked us, to do promoter fusion uh, uh, construct and show that the promoter is actually affected. So this is a case where Methylating by this enzyme, the 50051, this is the new nomenclature, I'm sorry, on the promoter actually decreases the effect uh, when you have a wild type uh, enzyme versus a mutant enzyme. You don't see any difference, but the lag Z, the middle units here, for example, keep decreasing because of this. So we think we have a mechanism here that when you express the helicobacter pylori cytosine methyl transfers in E. coli, it's causing, uh, it having an effect on mismatch repair genes, dam methylase, promoter, dam is gone, so it has a mutative frequency. We still have to explain this with the different specificities we're getting. So if mutative frequency is increased, overall mutation rates in the TECO light, which is expressing, should also be more. And that's exactly what we did in the next uh, study to show is an overall in vivo screen for determination of mutation frequency. This is the rifampicin assay that most uh, E. coli genetics people use it. And we showed that expression of this enhances the mutation frequency. When you have the uh, catalytically inactive mutant, for example, the frequent fold difference is not much, but when you have the active one, you get huge amounts. So all over the genome, mutations are increasing. 
Many of them might kill the cells, but we have never looked at. We have looked only at the cells which express an enzyme which is inactive. They could be truncated enzymes, they could be inactive enzymes, but we have only looked at active enzymes. And those active enzymes, we find different properties. So we think because of mismatch repair whole pathway, and possibly the SOS pathway also, which is affected, there's a whole lot of mess going on in E. coli when this particular gene is there. So this is the first case we think where cytosine methyl transferase uh, uh, methylation is important for gene expression. Now in E. coli and prokaryotic, uh, we know that the uh, adenine methylation, you know, in replication, transposition, and mismatch repair. But I think this is a, probably one of the earlier first cases to show the cytosine methyl transferase can also affect uh, many of these uh, many of these expressions. We've sent it to J. Back, uh, and uh, uh, it's come for revision. Uh, Nobody wants to accept it so easily. Uh, so this is the problem with this. So if it is happening in E. coli, we said, let's see in Helicobacter pylori what happens. And luckily for us, uh, and Professor Kobayashi knows these people in, uh, in Calcutta, uh, the, the National Institute of Cholera and Enteric Diseases, which uh, has a huge collection of Helicobacter strains, clinical isolates, from Bangladesh, from Pakistan, from India, from that area. There are lots of, lots of uh, uh, strains. Um, I brought some of the strains for sequencing now, but they have a huge collection. So Ritesh actually went there to uh, the, the experiment to do there in this institute called the National Institute of Cholera and Enteric Diseases. Ashish is the person. I looked at a number of strains to look for PCR amplification of this 5-1 from clinical isolates, and very clearly he found out that in many of these uh, things, there was variation. And the variation is like this. One of the interesting properties in many genes in Helicobacter pylori, as is true in many pathogenic organisms, there's something called phase variation because of dinucleotide repeats, AG repeats, or some kind of a dinucleotide repeats. And in different clinical isolates, you know, as you monitor, some of them are shown here, you have four AG repeats or five AG repeats, and therefore, things will go off or on, and expression of genes can change. Not only f uh, f from uh, patient to patient, but even within the patient, even within me, from one part of the stomach to another part of the stomach, the strain of helicobacter can be It can be the same now, it can be this, it will be different tomorrow, it will be different two days, three days. So it's all the time evolving. I don't know whether evolving, but there's a lot of uh, the, the genome is very plastic and it's very variable, and that is a very characteristic feature of Helicobacter pylori genome, unlike many other genomes. I, I'm not sure, if, is it true for all pathogenic organisms that the genome, the Helicobacter is very, very extreme in this. So what we saw in E. coli was not very unusual because in Helicobacter itself, uh, in pylori itself, you have these kind of sequences that Ritesh found that these kind of sequence analysis from the clinical isolates. And here you have, for example, when you have five of them in this strain called 26695, it is on, whereas in the one part of the duodenum from another part, you have many of them which are actually off strain and on. This is uh, from a patient isolated with an ulcer, and the one to 10, there are actually few of them shown there from the same patient shows phase variation in bipolar. So it is not unusual that what we saw in E. coli, that somehow this thing was happening. And it's not only this gene. There are a number of genes in helicobacter. All the pathogenesis genes, the CAG gene, the VAC gene, they all show these kind of variations. But one of these uh, methyl transferase is also very characteristic. So when he, he analyzed this, the collection that was there, between symptomatic and asymptomatic patients, it became very clear that uh, in symptomatic patients, uh, uh, in samples, you have this uh, the gene present, whereas in asymptomatic patients, you have very little of it. So many of these, uh, because of the availability and the epidemiological data that's available at the center, we could do some of these things, and we still continue to collaborate with them to do this. So what we saw in E. coli was true, is also true in uh, Helicobacter pylori. So the next question was to, knock out this gene in Helicobacter pylori. And the 26695 genome is a very standard genome. I must mention here that all these experiments have been done in Calcutta, not in my lab at all. We start, just started learning how to grow Helicobacter pylori. 
I'll be having problems. And I mentioned this to Professor Kobayashi and Yoshi. But uh, these experiments are done in Calcutta by Ritesh, by a student who went there. And the first thing was to knock out this 5-1, the cytosine methyl transferase. And this is by classical methods of the things. I will not go into details. And you should not ask me too many questions on this because I have, uh, I have not done the experiment at all. But these are very standard procedures of a chloramphenicol knockout construct, confirmed it by PCR and things like that. And that's the procedure. That's the procedure for transformation of helicobacter pylori with this knockout. Very well worked out in Calcutta. And to screen for the strains which have a knockout. And it not only did in 26695, he did in a number of other strains of helicobacter pylori also. And this is important. One other strain is SS1. And you'll find different names coming up. There are about five or six strains that he knocked out this gene. And most interesting, I'll tell you the result, is that in each strain, the knockout behaves different. It's not necessarily the same. So again, there's variation there. And again, uh, we have problems uh, you know, convincing uh, uh, referees that this is so much of variation here. And what is the characterization of the knockout mutant? What is the phenotype? What does this knockout actually do? One of the things that uh, in Helicobacter pylori, when, when it infects, there's an inflammation and uh, it stimulates interleukin-8, IL-8, uh, which promotes cell proliferation in the infected gastric mucosa. These are more details of it, but IL-8 is a characteristic marker, interleukin-8 marker. So when you have an infection, the IL-8 levels can be easily assayed. And immunologists have all these fancy kits. If you add this solution, this solution, then IL-8 goes up or goes down. It's very easy to monitor some of these things. So uh, Ritesh did some of these assays. He did these experiments in a, in a cell line. Uh, 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 I did a, what is that? A gastric carcinoma cell line, AGS cell line. Where you measure the IL-8 in, in the wild type and in the knockout. And very interestingly found that in the knockout strain, for example, you have a significant increase in the IL-8 levels. I'll come back to the biology of this and how to relate it with it. But this is the thing which he has done, not only in 26695, I'm just showing you the data, but he did in all the other strains, the four or, four or five other strains that he did that. And he found that in IL-8 productions, in all cases, went up in the knockout, which is not true of many other genes that he looked at. And I'll point out some of them there. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I keep forgetting. The next acid was this, the motility acid. The 26695 is not a motile strain. It doesn't. When you have a knockout of this, for example, this is a motility. This is on soft agar that you create and do this. And when you have a knockout, the motility is much more. And in the knockout, when you complement again, you get back to these kind of things. So motility genes are affected. Uh, in other words, flagellar genes, uh, and we did a microarray analysis, I'll show you that, which corroborate with this thing, saying that a knockout of this particular gene is uh, making these uh, uh, bugs more motile. Now, there's lots of things you can do. There's so many genes that can get affected and all. But these are the interesting things that we found. So when we did the microarray analysis of the wild type and the knockout of H. pylori, this is a summary of it. The motility genes are affected, the pathogenesis genes, the outer membrane protein, and the LPS, the lipopolysaccharide synthesis genes, are affected. Some are upregulated, some are downregulated. In some strains, it is this way. In some strains, it's another way. From strain to all the four or five strains that he did, there is variation. Only IL-8, we find that is commonly increased. In some, we don't find any changes at all, knocking out that gene. So we still don't understand what is happening. But we know that there's so much of variation in these genomes, in, in these strains. It's very fascinating and it's a must that one studies some of these things. Here is uh, details of this. So I'm just going to give you data for all of them. For the motility, pathogenesis, outer membrane and the LPS in one or two strains because there's a lot of information that we have. This is in outer membrane proteins. Again, you have all these uh, antigens very, very important. And uh, we actually monitored by RT-PCR uh, uh, at the microarray, confirmed by RT-PCR. In some of the strains that we did, we complemented and show again that you restore it. And therefore, this is very consistent. The lipopolysaccharide profile, for example, varies from one strain to another strain. 
the clinical versus uh, the uh, knockout versus the wild type. And here is the lipopoiosite diversity again. These uh, enzymes called the fucose and uh, things which add on these residues. Uh, these sugars here, for example, they all get affected. So it's been confirmed either by RT-PCR or by doing westerns by using antibodies, for example. Here, you have, for example, this is the virulence, for example, the CAG genes, for example. Uh, we actually looked at, uh, we had antibodies to this, and we actually showed that, that the levels, the protein levels of these uh, uh, pathogenic uh, uh, proteins are affected in the knockout sign, which is consistent in all the strains that you find. But well, some representative is shown here. So we have done OMP, the CAG, the VAPD, the VACA, and arginase. And again, there's a lot of biology involved in it and how these genes and the products are important as far as the bug is concerned, where the response for uh, thing happens. The host in turn also responses to these infections. So you can study both the process and the good model system to study host pathogen interactions. So these are some of the things that we have been doing with this uh, particular methyl transferase. And just to give you a very quick summary of this portion, that between virulence and avirulence that you have in Helicobacter, most of you are avirulent, many of us may be virulent, we don't know, but depending on the, the survival of the pathogen, the host depends upon its ability to modulate the balance between these two genes. So you can have two strains, one host, different and different, and depending on the population of this or this, you have the effect that can happen. So we are continuing to do the studies, now we would like to move this to the mouse model and actually do it in the mouse and show that some of these things happen. These are all done in cell lines. Um, I, I have never done cell lines, I've, I've, I've never seen a mouse, but we have people who will do a mouse and do the experiments for us. So I think this is an important point that what we found in E. coli, what we started with biochemistry, actually ended us uh, with this. Now, the other gene that we are working on, uh, the other methyl transferase is the 5-0, which is the adenine methyl transferase. And I said you can make a number of times and it remains constant. It doesn't change at all. It's very, very, just like a biochemist's uh, pleasure because it's so reproducible. But it's also very boring. It's not like a cytosine methyl transferase. But the adenine methyl transferase, you, know, you must remember that these methyl transferases recognize the same sequence. One does the top strand, one does the bottom strand. So in entomology terms, this is very interesting. So we now studied this methyl transferase alone. And to our surprise, this is an adenine methyl transferase and therefore it has DPP by, not PCQ. Okay? We cloned, overexpressed, purified it, confirmed by MALDI of uh, uh, peptide fingerprinting that this is a pure protein, made mutations in the, in the regions which flips out. Uh, this is base flipping experiments, which I told you for P15. And what we found, that this methyl transferase again has specificity changes, issues. It can recognize GAGG, it can recognize GAAG, it can recognize GGAG. And in this case, it methylates both the adenine residues. <coughs> it's an adenine methyl transfer. And most methyl transfers methylate only one residue. But this is the first case that we think we have where the enzyme methylates both the adenine residues. So Ritesh did a number of kinetic properties, the KCAT and KM, to show that this is entomologically true and that this enzyme behaves very well. There's no variation in theme, but only specificity is changed. That you can, it, it, it has a broadened specificity as compared to most restricted specificity. Now here's an example of how you do this experiment. So you take an oligonucleotide with this sequence, one half of is TAC1 and one half of is corresponds to ALU1. And you methylate it, both are methylated, then you can't cut by TAC1 and ALU1. And that is how we analyzed these fragments and showed that this uh, enzyme can methylate both the adenine residues. And that is what it is here. So this methylates both the adenines and then you actually cut it here and making fragments, you can actually count by radioactivity incorporation of methyl groups that you have fragments, uh, both uh, counts in the fragments. Another important thing in methyl transferase area 
is to find out how these enzymes bind to their sequence. For example, if you have a sequence like this and you have a sequence here, you want to know whether the enzyme binds, falls off, binds, falls off, binds and then methylates, or does it bind and then slide. So these two mechanisms are known as processive and distributive. And by kinetics, from some uh, very basic kinetics, if you do it carefully, you can get different kinds of uh, coordinates. I won't go into details of this experiment, but it's possible to do that. And we find that the phi zero methylates both adenines in a non-processive manner. That means it binds, methylates one, falls off, and then binds, methylates the other one, and falls off. Now, this is, uh, you know, one way or the other, it is unusual or, or not unusual, but the fact that it methylates two adjacent adenine residues is a very interesting feature here. So we now go back to the clinical isolates, and we found that from one of the strains called PG227, Helicobacter pylori strain, you have a, the phi zero methyl transferase, which methylates only GAGG, whereas the 26695 enzyme can methylate all three. So depending on the strain, the methylase, this particular methylase would methylate one, two, or three sequences. So again, there's a change here. Although it is not like so drastic as the 5-1 methyl transferase, patient samples or patient uh, clinical isolate enzymes behave quite differently. Now, you can purify the protein and do the methylation, or you can do something known as a far western. Uh, that we plan to do uh, here in the next two or three weeks that I'm here, to take DNA, methylate it, and then use antibodies against the adenine methyl transferase, uh, against the methyl adenine. And you can actually see that these things happen. If you want, I can just uh, explain here. In 26695, uh, you, if you use uh, these duplexes, you get uh, this, whereas if you use the 128 or the 127, only 1A is methyl, whereas if you have GGAG, it does not methylate at all. So that is how we analyze a number of these strains, uh, you know, purifying the enzymes to, to show that, that there's both by in vitro methylation assays and by far westerns that this is possible here at all. <coughs> if you knock out the strain, we didn't do many experiments because it grows very poorly. So we were unable to isolate RNA and do analysis here. So we are stuck with this strain because knockout of this gene from 26695 or from this uh, uh, strain, for example, uh, we don't get too much growth at all and therefore there's not much of RNA and we need to overcome this and then study what the microarray experiment will tell us. Now if you look at this enzyme, if you remember the first slide I showed you, the 50 and 51 are right next to each other. They're independently coded, there is a, a difference of one nucleotide. So, so if you insert one nucleotide now, for example here, and A is introduced here in this naturally occurring sequence, you can get a fusion protein. So you can get one polypeptide, which methylates, one, one half of it methylates the top strand, one methylates the bottom strand. And this is what Ritesh found, and he actually made this construct and made the construct so that you have the PCQ motif here and the DPP virus. So you have both the adenine and the cytosine methyl transferase, one polypeptide instead of two polypeptides that naturally occur in the 26695. And then uh, the single messenger RNA codes for this, uh, both this, and he showed that by, he purified it by in vitro translation, that method of the NEB kit that we have, purified the protein, and studied individual uh, enzyme properties and the combined one. And you have the properties here. And it so happens now, this is man-made. We put that A and made this fusion. But if you now analyze clinical isolates, there are a couple of clinical isolates from which he has purified where it's one protein, one protein completely. So helicobacter has insertion deletions. It can change protein structure in a wide variety of in some strains, there are two proteins. In some strains, it's a fusion protein. And therefore, the effects of this can be drastic. And I think it uses all these mechanisms to survive in this very harsh environment. How harsh and how it survives is something that we are still looking forward to. So this is one part of it. 
I'm going to move on to another set of methyl transferases and these are known as the phase variable genes in Helicobacter pylori and one such one which I'm going to talk to you about is this particular one called the 1369170. So we're finished with the 50 and 51. These were solitary methyl transferases, there was no corresponding restriction in sample. Whereas in the 1369170, the 171 is a restriction enzyme. But the 69 and the 70 are very interesting. Okay? The 69 and 70 are something like this. Yeah. Okay? This is 69, this is 70, and this is 71. This is a restriction enzyme. But the metal transferase here is split. Naturally, it is split. It, it doesn't make an enzyme. Both of them don't make an enzyme. But both have domains or motifs. Some motifs are in 6 9, some motifs are in 7 0. But a functional metal transferase is not made. And if a functional metal transferase is more, not made, the restriction subunit doesn't work because this belongs to type 3 RM system where you require R and M coming to tell. So again, when we looked at the sequence, when Ritesh looked at the sequence of 6, 9, and 7, 0, he found a number of Gs here. And this polymeric stretch of Gs, if you insert or delete, then you can make things into fusion. So what he did was to act an extra G here. There are 10 and he made it 11, I think, or the other way, uh, which is shown here. Yeah, this is what he did. So naturally, there are 10 Gs. When you add the 11 G, this come into fusion and you have a complete metal transferase. And this metal transferase belongs to that one group where there was no example, the eta metal transferases that I mentioned to you earlier, this one. You have alpha, beta, gamma, this, but this metal transferase comes to this category of eta. This is the first example of this metal transferase which Janusz had predicted that in the, there should be this possibility. Actually, now in our hands, we have made this metal transferase because we put an extra G and fused the 269 uh, six, and 70. So, when Ritesh did that, and we actually looked at uh, Helicobacter strains, clinical isolates, and we found in all strains, many strains, there's a huge gap only in 26695 that you can join together. In others, you can't put one G because there's a huge 200, 300 base pair gaps. But in 26695, by adding one G, you can make a fusion protein. And adding one G or removing one G is not very uh, difficult for Helicobacter pylori because it does all these kind of things. So at some point of time, it can create a functional metal list. At many times, there is no functional metal transfers. If there is no functional metal transfers, there is no functional restriction enzyme. So restriction enzyme is dead or inactive. But suppose by chance you make this metal transfers active, Bang, then it combines with the rest and you have a restriction enzyme. So the Helicobacter pylori uses all these strategies, phase variation, um, you know, hotspots for mutations, all sorts of things to make new genes and new products to survive in this. And that's what we think is required for it to survive in this. And here's in a metal transferase is a good example. Many metal transferases I've discussed here will show you that these kind of things happen here. So what Ritesh did was to actually make this um, into one, purified the protein, and then showed that you have uh, uh, this eta, the new metal transferase, actually recognizes the sequence TCAGC by these methods, the standard methods that I mentioned earlier, and actually did that. We actually started my lab before Ritesh came, another graduate student who is now completing his PhD after seven years. He started his work on Helicobacter pylori and he looked at one of the type 3 enzymes, a type 3 called the 592593. That is a rest gene and that's a mod gene, but there's a 74 base pairs gap between the two. We still don't know whether it's a functional restriction enzyme, but the modification methodist is what he has cloned, Arun Banerjee, who's cloned this and actually shown by enzymology that this is an active metal transferase. So this is a metal transferase belonging to the usual group and confirmed it by Maldi, did specificity, it recognizes this sequence. This is the adenine 
In other words, in the lab, we are doing all the methyl transferases in Helicobacter pylori. We want to characterize all of them and then do corresponding the restriction enzymes. And we started with type 3 enzymes. And now we have started with type 1. And uh, look at these things, because the type 2s have all been taken over by NEB, and they're doing a lot of work. But one of the most interesting features of Arun's enzyme, it has an acidic pH optima. All metal transferases work at 7.4, 7.5. This works at 5. At 7, it has no activity at all. So it must be important. It must be important for the bacteria in the stomach. So we don't know. But the in vitro experiments clearly suggest that pH stability and pH optima, that pH 5 is what this enzyme is all about. So we did a microarray of growing H. pylori at 4.5 and at 7.4. And again, we find, and I'll come to that, even this metal transferase in a number of pathogenesis upstream that this site is present. So again, differential promoter methylation may be one way of regulating many genes involved in H. pylori adaptation to harsh conditions. Now, I'll just very briefly tell you that, you know, doing growth condition at 7.4 and 4.5, there are differences. You can make a big thing about it. You can make, you can ignore it. Referees tend to ignore things, but we are excited about some of these things. That this gene, for example, shows a five-fold increase in expression in acidic growth as compared to neutral things. We did a knockout of this, again done in Calcutta, in our collaborator's work, uh, lab, lab, laboratory, and again looked at growth conditions at 4.5 and 7.4, and we have stark differences. I'm not going to tell you too much about this. Again, microarray analysis of the knockout and the wild type, again grown in 4.5 and 7.4. There are vast number of differences, and we're still in the process of confirming many of these by RT-PCR and things like that. The values are significant, but need to be confirmed by RTP. Some of them have been confirmed, some have not been confirmed, but this is what we are doing. But most interesting, the morphology becomes important. Uh, it's a, usually the wild type is this, the knockout is more something like this, or more saccharous in nature. You find these kind of structures that you find that. So knockout of this particular gene. So it must be affecting shape, uh, must be affecting genes which are involved in sheath formation and things like that. But this is something that uh, we plan to pursue and show that this is important. The last metal transferase that we are working, the last so far, where new metal transferases have been carried out, is this called the 1366-6768. Remember, 697 and 71 is another. So this is a type 2S restriction modification system. The other one was a type 3 restriction modification system. You have two metal transferases, M1 and M2, with one restriction. This is an N6 metal transferase, this is an N4, or vice versa. And we've actually started working on the restriction enzyme that when you express it, uh, when the restriction gene is expressed, you actually get up the less growth in cells. So Ritesh, again in the lab, purified these proteins and showed that one is an N4 cytosine methyl transferase and one is an N6 methyl adenine, both by far westerns and by biochemical analysis to show that this is what's happening. So these are the specificities of these enzymes. And most interestingly, it methylates single-stranded DNA. Most methyl transferases do only double-stranded DNA, but here we have a case of single-stranded DNA. Again, in the biology of this, it becomes very important as to what these roles are. So finally, I think, you know, what we conclude that RM systems, as most people have concluded earlier, I think, but from our own work, especially in pylori, is dynamic. Systems are born, systems are maintained, and systems die. And I think Professor Kobayashi's uh, uh, hypothesis is something like this, that this is evolving all the time. At any time, at any one snapshot, you have enzymes which are dead, some for the functional, and some are being born or something. And we think that the tensions between genomic integrity and diversification in H. pylori, uh, I don't know if it's from one of your papers. I've many, many times, uh, Professor Kobayashi has this very interesting uh, pictures that this adaptation and survival become very important. And I think we want to make a case that methyl transferases do indeed do that. Here's a case so you have an RM system, an R is lost, and M is added, the solitary methyl transferases. Then you have these fusions here, for example. And then you have evolution, when, you know, specificities keep changing. 
So this uh, H5 OT is a gold mine of RM system. It's a treasure for many because any time you can pick out a new enzyme and do this. <coughs> so this is Ritesh who has done all the work on H5 OT. So there's one person who did everything uh, on this. He's now in Urbana, Champagne. He just went last month. And he's the one who I wrote to for the details of SAM, which one to order, it's because I don't remember. So this is a lab and the, the uh, various things here. So let's stop here.